Hi everyone. Um, the unit we'll be looking at. To, my name is Shazia Khan, and the unit we'll be looking at today is three point two seven, which is the English legal system. We'll be looking at learning outcome four, which is to understand the operation of judicial precedent. In the last session, we looked at uh, learning outcome three, which was to look at uh, the uh, know the organisation and the work of the English courts in the UK. We looked at the different types of courts why the courts are so important in regards to <clears throat> ensuring consistency um, in e every court and ins ensuring that the law is consistent and applied right in each court. We looked at the hierarchy of civil courts, uh, the Supreme Court, why the Supreme Court is so important. We looked at uh, the Court of Appeal in regards to civil cases. We also looked at the Court of Appeal with regards to the civil division, criminal division, and then we looked at the High Court, which is the third highest court in the UK. We looked at the precedent and hierarchy of the High Court and why it is bound by precedent by the decisions of the, all the above courts, such as the Supreme Court, the European Court of Justice and the Court of Appeal. <clears throat> we looked at, in the High Court, the three divisions which make up the High Court, which are the Queen's Bench, uh, Bench Division, Chancery Division and Family Division and what each of them dealt with. Um, so things like the Queen's Bench Division um, dealt with specialist things in regards to um, commercial uh, court, mercantile uh, planning court. So we looked at them in regards to the Queen's Bench Division. We also then looked at the county courts and how, how they deal with cases. Um, and the tribunal services, um, we looked at the issue of uh, specialists in tribunals uh, such as uh, pensions, tax, land, discrimination, employment law. We then went on to the criminal courts and looked at the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. We looked at um, the Crown Court and um, why cases are brought to the Crown Court before a judge and a jury. Um, we then went on to look at uh, the different types of offences in Magistrates Court and also looked at the um, work of the Magistrates Court and what they do in regards to dealing with cases uh, which are less severe. And we looked at the, um, um, the issue regarding... Um, civil jurisdiction and then we looked at finally at the appeals process and we looked at how an appeal goes through to the court of appeal and uh, what happens if permission is granted what happens if permission is refused and then we looked at um, the supreme court in regards to the appeals process as well which is the highest court in the uk we're now going to go on to looking at um, the operation, learning outcome for the operation of judicial precedent and what judicial precedent is and why it's so important within the UK uh, constitution. So firstly, the learning outcomes. Explain how the rules of stare decisis, ratio decidendi and obiter dicta are used. We're going to look at differentiating between distinguishing, reversing, binding and overruling, giving examples of how they have been used in specific cases. We're, all gonna, we're also going to look at describing how courts are bound by each other with reference to the case of Young and Bristol Aeroplane Company Limited, 1944. And then we're going to look at the explaining the impact of res judic judicata. So 4.1 is to explain how the rules of stereo decisis, ratio decidendi and obiter dicta are used. So the first one we're going to go through is stereo decisis. But before I go through what it is, I want to uh, uh, put a video on for you in regards to what stereo decisis is. So here we're going to look at the doctrine of precedent in regards to stereo decisis. Lawmaking, the doctrine of judicial precedent. Stare decisis. The doctrine of judicial precedent, or common law, is based on stare decisis. That is the standing by of previous decisions. 
Once a point of law has been decided by the appeal courts in a particular case, that law must be applied in all future cases containing the same material facts. For example, in the case of Donahue v. Stevenson, the House of Lords held that a manufacturer owed a duty of care to the ultimate consumer of the product. This set a binding precedent which was followed in Daniel and Daniel v. R. White. The claimant suffered a burn to the throat from drinking lemonade which contained a chemical. The precedent from Donahue v. Stevenson had to be followed as the case contained the same material facts of a consumer suffering a personal injury from the product made by the manufacturer. In Grant v. Australian Knitting Mills, the claimant suffered a rash from wearing thermal underwear which contained a chemical. The precedent from Donahue v. Stevenson was still binding. It didn't matter that it was clothing rather than a drink that caused the injury. The material facts were that a manufacturer had caused injury to the consumer. A further example is the legal principle from Shaw v. DPP. The House of Lords set an original precedent creating a crime of conspiracy to corrupt public morals. The defendant had published a lady's directory detailing the services offered by prostitutes. This precedent was binding in Nuller v. DPP under the doctrine of stare decisis. In Nuller, the defendant was liable for conspiracy to corrupt public morals, for publishing a gay contact magazine. In summary, stare decisis means stand by the decision. This means that once a precedent has been set, it must be followed in all future cases containing the same material facts. This video is part of a series of videos on law. So as we can see, the video explained the principle of stare decisis, which we're going to go through in a little while. Um, when we look at judicial precedent, uh, this principle means that a court must follow and apply the law as set in the decisions of higher courts in previous cases. For example, if the judge dislikes an individual who dyes their hair gold in colour, he might resist to give the individual a fair treatment and this can influence the outcome of the whole case. Thus, the High Court must follow the decisions that are made by the Court of Appeal. The main advantage of using precedent is that it provides certainty in the law. So, stare decisis, let's go through that principle. And the video identified different cases in regard to stare decisis. <clears throat> This is a Latin term that means to stand by things decided. The principle that a court should follow uh, precedent established by previously decided cases with similar facts and issues to provide certainty and consistency in the administration of justice. Generally, there are two types of precedent. Binding precedent, which is precedent that a court must abide by in its adjudication of a case. For example, a lower court is bound by the decision of a higher court in the same jurisdiction, even if the lower court judge disagrees with the reasoning or outcome of that decision. The next one is persuasive precedent, and this is precedent that a court may, but it's not required to, to rely on in deciding a case. Examples of persuasive precedent include decisions from uh, courts in neighbouring jurisdictions and dicta in a decision by a higher court. As in the video it stated that uh, in the case of Donnie Ewan Stevenson, 1932, this is a good example of stare decisis, the House of Lords held that a manufacturer owed a duty of care to the ultimate consumer of the product and this was binding in the case of Grant and Australian Knitting Mills and also in the case of Shaw and DPP um, and Nuller and DPP, as mentioned in the video. The next principle we're going to be looking at is ratio decedendi. And for this, I have a video to play as well in regards to what this is. Judicial precedent. So this is an ratio. So this this is a video on ratio decidendi and case examples. Ratio decidendi. Ratio decidendi, simply translated, is reason for the decision. In relation to common law, the ratio decidendi forms the legal principle from the case. 
In the course of delivering a judgment, the judge will set out their reasons for reaching a decision. The reasons which are necessary for them to reach their decision amount to the ratio decidendi of the case. The ratio decidendi forms the legal principle which is a binding precedent. This means it must be followed in future cases containing the same material facts. For example, in the case of Donahue v. Stevenson, the decision was that the claimant was successful in her claim for personal injury suffered as a result of the snail in her ginger beer. The reason for the decision was that a manufacturer owes a duty of care to the consumer under the neighbor principle. This formed a binding precedent. A subsequent case of Grant v. Australian Cotton Mills, had to follow the binding precedent, set in Donahue v. Stevenson. In Grant, the claimant suffered a rash from wearing long johns, thermal underwear, produced by the defendant. It was found that the long johns contained a chemical. The material facts were that a manufacturer had caused a personal injury to the consumer. That meant the binding precedent set in Donahue v. Stevenson had to be applied. A further example of ratio decidendi is the case of Shure v. DPP. The defendant published a lady's directory detailing the services offered by prostitutes. The ratio decidendi of the case created a new crime of conspiracy to corrupt public morals. This was then binding in Canula v. DPP where the defendant published a gay contact magazine. It is important to separate the ratio decidendi from the obita dicta. Obita dicta refers to all things stated by a judge in the course of their judgment which are not necessary for the decision. For example, in R. V. Howe and Bannister, the House of Lords held that the defense of duress was not available to murder. This was the ratio decidendi of the case. The House of Lords went on to consider whether the defense should be available to those who attempt murder. They stated that the defense of duress should not be available to attempted murder. They did not need to consider this as the defendant was not charged with attempted murder, so this part of the judgment formed the obiter dicta. In summary, ratio decidendi means reason for the decision. This forms the legal principle from the case. This becomes the binding precedent which must be followed in future cases containing the same material facts. The ratio decidendi needs to be distinguished from the obiter dicta. That is things said which are not necessary for the decision. This video is part of a series of videos on law. So as we can see from the video, they identified uh, ratio decidenda and the importance of that for courts, but also looked at orbiter dicta with reference to case law. Uh, so ratio decidendi, as it explained, is a Latin term that means rational for the decision. The ratio decidendi of a case is the principle of law on which a decision is based. When a judge delivers judgment in a case, he outlines the facts which he finds have been proved on the evidence. Uh, then he applies the law to those facts and arrives at a decision for which he gives the reason, which is ratio decidendi. How to find ratio decidendi. So you look at your subject outline, reading list or case list. Take a peek at the topic headings, cases and journal articles listed above and below the case you're about to read. Doing this before you start reading the case will help to provide some context for your search for the ratio and help you to avoid getting sidetracked by all that orbiter. Read the head note. When you start reading the judgment, begin with the head note. This will highlight the key issues or legal principles considered by the case. How to find ratio decidendi. Read the whole case. The ratio uh, normally appears towards the end of a judgment, but unfortunately you can't just skip to the end. In its most basic format, a judgment starts by outlining the facts of the case before considering the legal arguments presented to the court and then making the decision. 
The court's analysis of the legal arguments is also essential reading, although the ratio will probably be located at the end of the legal analysis, just before the court makes its findings that the defendant is guilty or the defendant was negligent, etc. Focus on the key facts and arguments. Focus on your attention on the precedents or legal principles the court discusses at length and the facts of the case that judges emphasise. Then we've got the aha moment. The ha aha moment is the ratio is essentially the reason why the court reached a particular decision. The outcome of the case therefore depends on the ratio descending. So if you read something that makes you think you know which party is going to win or lose, you may be in a ratio territory. Dealing with multiple judgments. If there is a high court decision where some of the judges have written a separate opinion, the ratio won't be in the descending judgment. Instead, it will look for the ratio in the majority decision. If many of the judges agreed or were enough, close enough in their view of the key legal principles, you may be able to distill a ratio or at least a sort of ratio if there were some small differences in opinion. If the majority agrees on the outcome of the case, but took completely um, different views of the law to get there, you might not be able to find a ratio. Don't panic if you can't find the ratio. If you can't find the ratio, look at the case up in your textbook, casebook or lecture slides. There's a very good chance that the ratio descendi will be explained, if not actually quoted in the case summary. Even if you think you've found the ratio, this can be a good way to confirm that your approach is working. So the next uh, rule is <clears throat> obiter dictum. Orbit, the obiter dicta are comments, guidance and other observations made by judges when they give their rulings. The courts are not bound to follow comments made obiter in earlier rulings, but they are very useful when judges are considering cases. Obiter remarks are not essential, as I've just mentioned, to a decision and do not create binding precedent. However, um, obiter remarks for of senior judges, for example, may be indirectly intrusive or persuasive, especially in areas which the law is developing. The use of obiter dictum. In reaching decisions, courts sometimes quote passages of orbited dicta found in texts of the opinions from prior cases, with or without acknowledging the quoted passages' status as orbited dicta. A quoted passage of orbited dicta may become part of the holding or ruling in a subsequent case, depending on what the latter court actually decided and how the court treated the principle embodied into the quoted uh, passage. An example of uh, orbiter dicta is if a court dismisses a case due to the lack of jurisdiction and offers opinions on merits of the case, then these opinions constitute orbiter dicta. Now we're going to go on to look at differentiating 4.2, differentiating between uh, distinguishing reversing, binding and overruling, giving examples of how they have been used in specific cases. <laughs> the first one we're looking at is distinguishing. Distinguishing is the method which can be used by a judge to avoid following a past decision which he would have otherwise have to follow. It means that the judge finds the material facts of the case he is deciding are sufficiently different for him to draw a distinction between the present case and the previous case. Distinguishing a case on its facts or on the point of law involved is a device used by judges, usually in order to avoid the consequences of earlier inconvenient decision, which is in strict practice binding on them. What is reasonably distinguishable depends on the particular cases and the particular court. Some judges being more inclined to distinguish disliked authorities than others. In a uh, case, Jones and Secretary of State for Social Services, 1972. So in 
In the case of Jones and Secretary of State for Social Services, 1972, Lord Reed stated that it is notorious that where an existing decision is disapproved but cannot be overruled, courts tend to distinguish it on inadequate grounds. I do not think that they act wrongly in so doing. They're adopting the less bad of the only alternatives open to them. But this is bound to lead to uncertainty. At the other extreme, Lord Justice Buckley in Olympia Oil and uh, Produce Brokers 1914 uh, stated that I am unable to add C any reason to show why that decision which I am about to pronounce is right, but I am bound by the authority which, of course, it is my duty to follow. An example um, on the slides is the case of Balfour and Balfour and Merit and Merit. Um, in, in the case of Balfour, a husband worked overseas and agreed to send maintenance payments to his wife. At the time of the agreement, the couple uh, were happily married. The relationship later saw, soured and the husband stopped making the payments. The wife sought to enforce the, um, the agreement. Uh, it was held that the agreement was purely a social and domestic agreement and therefore it was presumed uh, that the parties did not intend to be intend to be uh, legally bound. And the case of Merit and Merit 1971 is where a husband left his wife and went to live with another woman. There was £180 left owing on the house, which was jointly owned by the couple. The husband signed an agreement whereby the uh, whereby he would pay the wife £40 per month to enable her to meet the mortgage payments. And if she paid all the charges in connection with the mortgage until it was paid off, he would transfer his share of the house to her. When the mortgage was fully paid, she bought an action for a declaration that the house belonged to her. It was held that the agreement was binding. The Court of Appeal distinguished the case of Balfour and Balfour on the grounds that the parties were separated. Where spouses have separated, it is generally considered that they do not intend to be bound by their agreements. The written agreement signed was further evidence of an intention to be bound. The difference between Balfour and Balfour and Merit and Merit talk about the intention to create legal relations um, in Merit and Merit. It was held that the circumstances of both the cases were different because Balfour and Balfour, the couple, were married, whereas in this in the case of um, Merit and Merit, they were separated. The next one to look at is uh, reversing, and this is where the court higher up in the hierarchy overturns the decision of a lower court of on appeal in the same case. For example, the Court of Appeal may disagree with the legal ruling of the High Court and come to a different view of the law. In this situation, it reverses the decision made by the High Court. The next one to look at is binding, a binding precedent. A binding precedent is a decided case which a court must follow by law. A case is only binding if the legal principle involved is the same and the facts of the case are the same. A later uh, court can circumvent an inconvenient precedent, which would otherwise be binding by distinguishing it on the facts or on the legal principle involved. Binding precedent arise from important previous cases and binding future judges, which must follow the precedent as mentioned. However, a binding precedent will only apply where the facts of the original case are sufficiently similar to those that appear in the new cases. And the decision was made by the court that is higher than the court currently deciding upon the, uh, upon the issue as mentioned. However, a binding precedent can be overturned or departed from, for instance, if there's a change in the law or even in societal norms. Uh, that means that the previous ruling is no longer good law. Only a higher court can depart from a binding uh, precedent. The next one is, um, sorry, binding precedent uh, just carried on. So precedents can be binding. That is, it must be followed in later cases as purely persuasive, where it may or may not be used to influence later cases as judges are not bound by them. 
the, to determine if a precedent is binding or persuasive, the judge would have to consider these main factors. The judge would have to consider the material facts of the case. So each case is uh, different, so they must consider that. In order for a precedent to be binding on a judge in a later case, the material fact of the two cases must be similar. OK, so they need to look at the bo both the cases and identify the similarities between them. The second element is that the hierarchy of the courts, the higher up the court is in the court structure, the greater their ability to form a binding decision on lower courts. And then thirdly, the ratio decedendi and obiter dicta, which was discussed earlier on in regards to what elements of the courts would take into account. The next rule is um, overruling. <clears throat> Overruling is where a court in a later case states that the legal rule decided in an earlier case is wrong. Overruling may occur when a higher court overrules a decision made in an earlier case by a lower court. For example, the Supreme Court overruling a decision of the Court of Appeal um, or when the House of Lords used its power under the practice statement to overrule a past decision of its own. And an example of that is the case of um, Pepper and Hart, and also the case of uh, which overruled the earlier decision of Davies and Johnson, 1979. 4.3. Describe how courts are by, bound by each other with reference to Young, the case of Young uh, against Bristol Aeroplane Co. Limited, 1944. 2-A-L-L-E-R-293. So Jung, So I'll give you a little bit on the facts of uh, the Young and Bristol Corporation case and what it was identified. So the facts of this case is that the claimant, um, the plaintiff was employed at the defendant's workshops, received injury in an uh, accident arising out of and in the course of his employment and received compensation under the Workmen's Compensation Acts. He then sought to obtain damages in respect of the same accident, alleging that the defendants in breach of their statutory duty had failed to fence one of their machines, which he was using in their defence, the defendants pleaded. In the further alternative, the defendants say that the plaintiff before the commencement of this action claimed and received compensation under the Workmen's Compensation Acts in respect of the accident. The plaintiff is thereby barred from recovering damages in respect of the said accident. This plea was based on uh, section 29, subsection one of the Workmen's Compensation Act 1925 on the authority of a decision of the Court of Appeal in Perkins and Hugh Stevenson's Sons Limited 1940, the commissioner gave effect to the plea in favor of the defendants. The plaintiff appealed. So in, in this case, um, it was established that the Court of Appeal is bound to follow its own decisions um, and those of courts of coordinate jurisdiction, except in the following circumstances. The court is entitled um, and bound to decide. Which of the two previous conflicting decisions of its own it will follow. The court is bound to refuse to follow a decision of its own which cannot stand with a decision of the House of Lords and the court is not bound to follow a decision of its own if the decision was given per incurium, for example, where a statute or a rule having statutory effect which would have affected the decision was not brought to the attention of the earlier court. So 4.4, the impact of um, rest judicator. Rest judicator, um, a definition in the Spencer and Bower and Handley 2009 fourth edition identified rest judicator as a decision pronounced by judicial tribunal having jurisdiction over the cause and the parties that disposes once and for all 
the matter is so decided so that except on appeal, it cannot be relitigated between the parties or their privies. The thrust of the doctrine is to prevent a party from relitigating an issue or a defence which has already been determined, known as cause of action estoppel or issue estoppel, or which could have previously been litigated. The latter principle had been established in the case of Henderson and Henderson, 1843, and ensured as a matter of important public policy, the finality of judgments so as to prevent the waste of judicial resources on repeated hearings of the same issues. Res judicata principles. In Virgin, in the case of Virgin Atlantic Airways, uh, Limited against Zodiac Seats UK Limited 2013, Lord Sumption identified the six key principles which make up the doctrine. Firstly, number one is a party is prevented from bringing subsequent proceedings to challenge an outcome that has been already decided. So the cause of action estoppel. Number two. If a claimant succeeds in the first action and does not appeal the outcome, he may not bring a subsequent action on the same cause of action, i.e. to recover further damages. Number three, the doctrine of merger treats a cause of action as having been extinguished once judgment has been provided and accordingly the claimant's only right is the judgment itself. Number four, a party may not bring subsequent proceedings on an issue that has already been determined, and this is issue estoppel. Number five, a party may not bring subsequent proceedings which should and could have been dealt with in earlier proceedings, um, and this was used in the Henderson and Henderson principle. This is a general procedure rule against abusive proceedings. So these are some of the references used in today's session um, and we finished today's session and this session was on uh, judicial uh, precedent and um, it is very important just to conclude the, that the principle of judicial precedent is really important in um, in, in regards to a court following and applying the law as set by decisions of higher courts in previous decisions, uh, you know, um, and it is to provide certainty in the law um, because we need to bear in mind that it provides the idea of how cases are decided. So we must uh, look for similar material facts and then we are bound, courts will be bound by this. And the whole point is to ensure consistency and fairness in regards to each individual case. So these are the references in regards to today's sessions, which is learning outcome four. So we finished learning outcome four and you can get on with uh, the... Uh, um, assignment area for learning outcome four um, and if there's any additional reading or any case law that you need to look at Moodle has additional reading and cases that you can refer to um, and then the next session we'll be doing is to do with the sub assignment discussion area thank you for attending today's session these are some of the references as well thank you